I'm going to be... Oh, yes, I am. Okay. Oh, that's a good spot for me. So, wow. Half of the people are left. We're going to talk about green ceiling, which you probably read in the program. It's not about home decoration, but it's very female related since the last Women in Tech panel. We're going to talk about financing. So, those who, I would love to actually first, before we get started on anything, say how many here are startups? Who is startup? Okay, no female startups, no female entrepreneurs. Well, uh, then you have obligation to deliver this message to them and how many are working in finance or studying finance thinking of investment banking and all that stuff okay good then you also have a very important lesson here uh, so my goodness no what are you others doing then you can you need to be really really good advocates for us since uh, green ceiling is uh, something uh, similar to glass ceiling which you all know is about how females have struggling to advance in in the corporate world so green ceiling is the same in financing it's uh, latest study maybe i can i'm going to tell it shortly and then i will uh, introduce these lovely ladies who are going to discuss how to change the world uh, regarding financing for um, for females. So green ceiling, it's, a, it's there's a latest study in the David Eccles University made in February this year, so it's very fresh and I've read it and I was trying to like find loopholes and like beg to God it's not correct. And so since many studies have usually, you know, there's a, they're made to support the thesis if you want to be saying it in an ugly way. So, but this one is very, com it's very well uh, concluded. It shows that there's systematic bias against female CEOs in IPO prospectors evaluations, meaning that when your company has really taken off, you found the hockey stick, you need the growth funding, you're closing to <laughs> go to stock market and create a lot of jobs. Uh, you're going to be faced with a situation that you're a female and uh, you're not that uh, attractive anymore. So the study, uh, which included 45% of the um, people who uh, participated in the study are females. So the most disturbing part is in, uh, both females and males uh, found males more attractive as invest, uh, male CEOs as more attractive investments. So um, that leaves us to a really big, uh, task here and for that I'll be joined with uh, to my left with is it Danae? Danae? Okay, Danae Ringelman. She is the co-founder and COO of Indiegogo which I hope that you've been here already have met or heard and Indiegogo is a crowdfunding platform that is democrat democratizing financing for a lot of, lot of companies and now you have eight, how many companies do you, how many people do you have on the platform? Um, we've had tens of thousands of campaigns launch in 196 countries and we're distributing millions of dollars every week to campaign owners across the, across the world. So that shows there's a lot of entrepreneurial, you know, thrive in the world and crowdfunding is one of them. Then we have Janet Gusko, she is ma management, no, that was communication management scientist, that's very hard, from uh, Osterfeyer University. Wow, and she's freelancing now and she will be, you know, highlighting the things regarding communication when raising funding. So even few males, it will be very uh, interesting to hear how, to, how that affects the fundraising. And then we have Linda, which you all of you already heard, and she's taking the big leap from uh, corporate world to startup world and she's also as I know uh, doing bootstrap she's bootstrap and they are raising the first round of funding soon so uh, they'll be very interesting to hear how she as CEO of Cube Social handles that great so back to the to the study uh, if that wasn't clear did you sort of got the, so the key point is as in both males and females have have this systematic bias. So if you have a skirt, you know, well, I do have it today just for, just for, just for the occasion. 
uh, it's, uh, you're less likely to be interest, interested as an investment. It was four times higher for males to, to raise uh, funding, and uh, the stock price was 11% higher for uh, male-led uh, companies. So uh, that leaves us to a, to a big task now. And I would like to start with, you know, with your background, since I know that you have also investment background, investment bank background. So since both females and males had that, had that bias, how do you uh, think that we can uh, come around it? And see if you first, with your background, if you've... Uh, First of all, I back a little bit. If you agree with the study, if you, regarding your background, if you find that the, even as a female in that world, even if you probably didn't necessarily work with the investments itself, if you, if you find that that would sounds sounds correct. Um, well, what I would start with is maybe digging a little bit deeper into the numbers to really understand. Uh, which um, which VCs are showing bias towards men versus women? Because I know the best VCs out there um, are obsessed with with numbers and they're obsessed with traction. So I would argue that the best VCs out there are people who are making their decisions based on data versus uh, based on any kind of emotional responses. Um, or inputs that they're getting from actually, um, um, you know, sitting across the table from from the entrepreneur. That said, um, that said, what what I found is that you know our investors are people that have been following us for a while, and so when we first approached them. They took a meeting and then, or when they approached us, we took the meeting and then, you know, a few months later we went back and had another meeting. But it was always about the numbers and it was always about the traction. And so my advice to young female <laughs> CEOs or founders is, is be obsessed with your data, be obsessed for your traction. Not because you want to like fight the female bias, but because you want to run a great business <laughs> and you need traction and data. So if you just focus on that, a lot of the um, misperception issues hopefully will go away. Um, that said, I have a really good friend. She's the CEO of Tripping.com, which is this like kayak for uh, home rentals. So like a bunch has a bunch of Airbnb type sites, and it aggregates all that. And she her company is exploding. She just raised a round of um, capital. And I asked, I forwarded uh, your email to her. I'm like, hey, do you have any thoughts? I'm going to be talking to a whole bunch of people um, about this. And she's like, actually, I do. I have, um, I definitely have very recent direct experience. And she, she came away with two, two pieces of advice. One is she shared with me a piece of advice that she got from a female venture capitalist uh, before she started raising money. And she said... Um, if you're ever kind of in a meeting with a, with a venture capitalist and you're not sure how it's going, well, remember, it, they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. You're trying to see if, if this is an investor you want to work with. And um, she said to watch two things. One, um, when she asks a question to the venture capitalist and the, and the, and the person looks at her partner, her male co-founder, and answers the question to him, he, he, she recognizes there's an instant bias against women and she knows she does not want to work with him because he will have that bias and it'll come out over and over again. The other thing is um, a, f a female entrepreneur should always ask the investor, especially if it's a guy investor, what his wife does for a living. And if his wife is like an ambitious, you know, someone, whether it's a doctor, businesswoman, or or whatever, you know that they're not intimidated by women because they married, they married a strong one. And um, if they are offended by that question or they're embarrassed to talk about what their wife does or whatever, there's clearly some issue there. And that kind of like bias against women is going to come out in your relationship with them as an investor. So I thought that was a really interesting insight. That came from a, a female venture capitalist who has her own fight directly with, you know, being only, like one of, you know, 
one woman out of 20 in the venture world too. So anyways, I thought those were two interesting pieces of advice that I wanted to share with all of you. So you can get into the psychology of an investor just as much as they can get into the psychology of an entrepreneur. Well, thank you for those insights. I will also, in the end, since the goal of this is not just to dwell into how you know, horrible thing this is and how bad things are, in, instead of just try to find constructive suggestions and how to deal with this bias, which then we already have two great advice, and I will try to you know, run through and then tweet later when I can tweet. So uh, it's um, highly interesting. But then even talk about the, actually, it's the communications face-to-face. -face. So um, Janet, you also, when you're doing the communications and work with startups, is it when they face to face, or is it like first sending the pitches, or would you, you know, share what you find in the studies and how to how to uh, approach that in a communication way? Oh, you have that. Well, um, first of all, I would um, just very shortly do some number crunching as well, because I think it's important to understand um, what uh, the green ceiling is actually about, because um, when we look at the US, do you hear me? No? OK. Um, when we look at the US, um, pretty much half of the private health um, companies are run by women. But, um, and also over a third of women actually work in, in, the, in the tech world. But um, out of the companies that are actually backed with venture capital, only 10% um, um, are female-led. So there's, there's quite a gap. And it's, it's interesting that the um, study we, you, you just mentioned actually uh, shows systematic bias we uh, should all be aware of. I think it's important to, to understand that. Um, I think when it comes to um, startups and communication and also in terms of representing themselves, um, what the study also showed and what I can, um, uh, what I can, what I can see when I work with, with uh, females, um, especially in the, in the CEO position or in the executive position, it's more that um, the focus is really on specific characteristics of that person. So we see really um, stereotypes or, or systematic bias towards characteristics that are associated to be rather female or rather male. And um, here we have the uh, think manager or think executive, think male um, problem, the dilemma, because many of those characteristics that we uh, just, you can pretty much say naturally or from growing up, that you associate with leadership, being aggressive, being bold, being um, very self-confident, are rather associated with natural, uh, average men. So there's no there's no problem in that because that relationship is really close. While um, rather female uh, stereotypes or female uh, characteristics such as understanding, putting others first, being the tear uh, taker of the group. Um, those are really not reflecting that managerial or, or leadership style. So here's something, I think, on a, on a, on a personal, individual level that uh, I think would be important to be discussed. But um, I would go one step further. I would like to, 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 to get that panel also one step further and discussing actually um, different levels. So the individual um, of the CEO, but also what about the team? and diversity in the, in the management team, um, and also about the environment, because I think that's very important. You just mentioned the female uh, VC. I thought it was very, very important, but um, most of, most, uh, first of all, there are not that many of them around. Um, and second of all, um, there are not as many, you could say, direct networks or direct connections between female CEOs, or, or, uh, between female CEOs and venture capitalists. So, I think there are quite a few, quite a few topics. So you would uh, still say that you need to adjust your your pitch uh, in different stages, also like the early stage and later stage, and then who you pitch. I mean, that's what you always have to do. Like you have to know who you're pitching and who you who you want to choose to work with. But then again, you have to adjust who you'll be pitching to, depending on your female entrepreneur or male entrepreneur. Would you do those recommendations? Well. Um there are different approaches in terms of representation, about, um, about reputation management, about building a brand of yourself, self-PR, such things. Um, well, one part could be um, to ignore, to say it's post-gender, there's no female business, male business, there's just business. That's one approach um, that um, I've, I've seen around quite a lot. Then um, there's the approach to say, 
well, isn't that cool? I'm, I'm the only woman in the room, so I get instant attention. Why don't I use it strategically actually for me? Everybody's going to listen to me. Um, we had that um, Michael Arrington post on TechCrunch who said, uh, stop blaming me. Actually, um, every female um, entrepreneur that uh, I will hear of will be featured by me. So you're in the spotlight. So that's the other, um, that's the other strategy. And then the third one would actually be adaption. It's true. Um, so what's the social cons uh, consensus? What is seen to be most likely to be successful? And that, um, as I mentioned, would be rather male characteristics. So what we see in the corporate world, but also in the startup world, would be uh, coaching uh, for pitch for different levels, um, different stages, um, target group oriented, who are you talking to? Um, yeah being rather aggressive, bold, short sentences, <laughs> both, both feet on the ground, such yeah. things. No. You oh. Something, I know this is small, but you just said short sentences. So my friend and I did an experiment. So she was, um, I mean, we raised money a while ago, but she literally was going through it just now. And she said, um, she got some advice from a male entrepreneur friend of hers. Um, to basically like shorten her notes back to the um, investors when they reached out and to almost be borderline rude to them. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, well, I used to be, I'm a nice person. She's like a really nice person too. She's like a phenomenal CEO, incredibly data-driven, makes really great decisions, you know, all the kind of leadership stuff that you want. Um, but she's also a nice person. So when she signs her emails, she would always say things like, have a nice day, or I look forward to seeing you next time, or you know, something very casual but very friendly. And she, would, she started um, experimenting with that, and um, in the number of emails where she'd get replies, uh, when she had a, a, a word like, have a nice day, or see you next time, or something, she, the, the ratio of replies that she got from emails like that versus the ratio of replies from emails that she like hardly signed, where, she's, where if the investor said, we'd like to meet, um, she would just say, um, I'm available Wednesday at 12, period, Jen. You know, that's it, like, <laughs> very curt. The response rate was much higher when she let go of the like niceties. And so getting back to like the cultural differences, women are socialized to be nice when they're young and guys are socialized to be like whatever, harsh or whatever. Um, if you let go of a little bit completely consciously, you actually might affect your response rate, which is kind of sad that it takes something like that and it kind of shows the emotional intelligence of the investor you're dealing with, which is maybe indicative of someone you don't want to work with anyways. but. It's, a, it's just another data point for you to use in your decision of whether you want to work with that investor or not. Yeah, one, um, just, just a short um, note to that. One female entrepreneur told me uh, once that um, she actually learned to just uh, finish conversations with, I'll handle that. What? With, I'll handle that. I handle that. It's fine. I handle that. Yeah. I, I, can, no... I can do this. I deal with it. Okay. Great, Linda. Since uh, you're just about to raise a new CEO, you also have a male uh, co-founder, which is uh, that you also Danny have. And uh, you, Danny, told me that when you were fundraising, you were not so involved in the uh, fundraising process. So it was your your male co-founder who did that. Which and that also it was perceived more positively that uh, you had he had a female co-founder. So you'd be great at marketing and whatever or or. What, he, what, the, what our investors said um, was, and you know, I've gotten to know them well now as well, but um, what they said is it will be good for marketing. And what they meant by that is um, probably marketing and recruiting of great employees. And at, you know, over half our company is female in a tech startup in San Francisco. That like doesn't exist. And I, a lot of that has to do with the fact that like a lot of our star employees um, saw me speak at like a women in tech conference or whatever, and then they sought to, sought us out. So uh, the, they, the women care about having strong leaders, and so um, it's actually helped us have a larger pool of talent to draw from. Uh, so that's and the and I to our investors' credit, I think that they were recognizing that. No, for sure they're great. I mean, great investors are great investors, and they invest in great teams, and then teams who attract great talents and diverse teams. So none of that is actually like new and it's, it's good to have these positive stories. 
and except that what the study shows. But Linda, first before we go through forwards to the to the study, so tell me how about your fundraising now? Since you are you actively involved, and how do you uh, how do you perceive that? What's interesting to me is how, how the gender issue even comes about. So I came from a very male-dominated corporate life. And it used to amuse me when it first got brought to my attention that my gender played a role. And the reason it did was I'm a Chinese woman. I fit two different tick boxes, right? And every time I moved divisions, as I got more senior, there were obviously very few of Chinese women. So my male colleagues would say, oh, no, you just mucked up our statistics. We've lost two of those tick boxes. And, and, and so it used to amuse me that that would be the only time my gender would even be mentioned at work was the fact I mucked up the department's statistics. But for the rest of the time, it was about doing my job. It's about the role that you play and how you contribute. However, things that got brought to my attention were, as we got more senior, because there were fewer women, there would be very specific, I guess, training or communities that were tied around us as a smaller subset. And to Jeanette's earlier points, it's about how it's the majority trait is a male trait or a female trait. But of course you can get men that are not so confident, which is then being said as a typically female trait. Uh, and I guess some of the, the themes that came through, so for women, it is quite often, so confidence is absolutely one of those things. You know, are you, I remember going on a, a, a presentation course and we were videoed and played back to us. And the, one of the first things the trainer said to us is, when I play this back to you, there will be two distinct reactions in the room. The men will all sit there going, check me out, I, I a handsome fellow, don't I look good today? And all the women will be going, oh my goodness, I need to lose a few pounds, I, I need to do my hair, or no, why didn't anyone tell me I looked like this before I stood in front of the video? And I thought that was quite interesting because it's just those traits about the confidence that you have and, and how potentially, on the whole, women are harder on themselves, that they can be more critical about themselves. But actually then tying that back into investment, what's been interesting to me is actually my, my um, experiences. We haven't raised funding, we're self-funded so far, but we've had approaches, we've had conversations. And actually we've been approached by a lot of people that are quite interested in a female-led startup. And what they tell me is, we like working with women entrepreneurs because, and it's the, the traits that they're applying to women, they're more dedicated, they're more hardworking, they're better at building relationships, they juggle things better. Now, all of these traits can be applied across every gender, right? It's just how people are kind of compartmentalizing them. So that one, that's the first thing. I think it's that confidence and, and how you apply it into your work and, and how you apply it professionally. So I hate speaking publicly. Um, I'm, I get very nervous about it. But it's a key part of my job and professionally I need to be able to do it. So it's how you handle that to deal with the situation. So it doesn't mean that you have to be naturally good at something. It doesn't have to be a natural gender trait of yours. It's how you handle it professionally that's the most important. So that's the confidence element. And the second element I would say in terms of uh, Danae talking about pieces of advice. One of the key themes I've noticed, and with women that I've mentored as well, the female traitors that we self-select out. And again, men can do this. So what a woman may well do is read a, a, a job spec. Re as they go through all the requirements of it, they'll pick out every element that they cannot do and not apply for that job. And on average, men will read that same job spec, pick out every element that they can, and kind of won't notice the other ones, and apply. And so the key thing there, the key learning, whether male or female, is making sure that you're present for that opportunity. You know, why are you not even presenting yourself for it? What is stopping you from doing that? Because other people that don't fulfill all those requirements will certainly be applying, and you're not putting yourself in a position to compete with them in that. So those are the two things that I would take away from it, and those are you know, how it's impacted my experiences. Great. So at this moment, we both are doing like, I mean, a round. So and the study was like the later round, which brings to this more concern since it's it's a part of like creating jobs and economy. Since almost 40 or 50 percent are female entrepreneurs, and you know if they hit the ceiling when it's time to accelerate, then you know no jobs are going to be created on that. And the, the funny thing is this, uh, this um, it's not funny, uh, the great thing about this study is it's like it really tried to remove all the bias like ethnicity, 
and the physical attractiveness and all, all the, the top management team was very diverse and they even photoshopped, you know, the people they used only Caucasian. So, you know, all that, try to really remove these other underlying biases you have. And the only thing left was that then they switched the theme, you know, the name of the CEO. <laughs> and that's what gets, uh, gets scary. So I thought, you know, there's a lot of things you can do and handle this bias, which we got great advice. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with in, in this person to person and the communications? And everyone has a hard time raising money. It's like I talk to, I work with early stage startups and it's like, you know, regardless is a male or female, there's a, as many different stories about how hard it is, how long it takes, and, you know, it, it's about dating. So, you know, some people get more lucky, you know, earlier, you, you find the one, you build a relationship, and, and, and then you sign the term sheets, and, and for others, it takes longer time. So, it's, there's so, as many stories as there are fundraising uh, events. But, uh, you know, to, to find, if we could suggest to the world, like, you know, you know, suggest how to find new ways to, how to change this systematic bias that we not even ourselves aware that when we see male, I mean, we find males more competent, we're gonna put more higher stock price on them. That's, uh, so, so how would we, uh, what ways do we change the, the ecosystem and the fund, you know, is it the crowdsourcing where people, you know, your investors are gonna be, you know, more committees and it's more transparent and or is it the new, new VC that Dave McClure recently just so at the evolution of VC and they can be like the more operational, the geeks, the comes from the accelerators and they, you know, so they naturally bond with the community and, you know, start, you know, fading away a little bit those, you know, gender issues. So the whole, the whole uh, scene is changing or what do you think? Do we, if we give advice to you know the VC industry and the investment bankers who sit there and they only see numbers, which I do agree, and the study also showed, you know, you, you would think that you know that high level, it's just all about numbers and not about the, you know, the female or male. So how would we? What would we suggest uh, that we could uh, change and uh, long term that bias, or do we just have to adjust that? You know, we're talking to males. We have to be keep it short and be, you know, half rude. <laughs> or uh, what do we do? Uh, loaded question. Um, I mean, I think it's a few things. I think it's starting with yourself and whether you're male or female and look at where your points of self-confidence break down and doing whatever you need to do to help build your confidence back up. Um, so whether it's taking a class to round out your experience in something or it's hanging out with your friends more because you just feel more confident when you're around your friends or uh, working out or whatever it is, um, start with yourself. Uh, the second is uh, I, would, I would network the heck out of um, all the amazing kind of women in tech, people in tech, not just women in tech, but people in tech events, and really start to ask the hard questions, like seek out entrepreneurs that have raised large rounds of funding, and ask for their honest advice, like what mattered, what didn't matter. Um, get data. Um, ask which, which investors invested in them because of their traction, and which investors invested in them because they just kind of liked them. Um, and, and maybe for a while, like I know um, there's a little bit of a, a bifurcation between um, younger investors and older investors. And um, in our experience, there's a little bit of also a bifurcation between um, American investors and non-American investors. And um, specifically, I know my friend actually she had a lot harder time with non-American older investors. They just couldn't see her as a leader. And I don't know, that's, and maybe we just need to kind of wait for those folks to, to die off a little bit. That sounds awful. But, or just target, target, target investors that don't exhibit these biases based on what the other entrepreneurs you're meeting exist. And just force your hand, because I think just the more the more women that get into the game, 
the, the bias will slowly dissipate. Okay, and then we should also take this to the, uh, you know, the education, since you know, still going to be investment bankers that are going to be, you know, crunching the numbers and still have the bias when they look at the top management and the CEO level and say, oh, they will, you know, find it less attractive. So bring it also to education, and you know, just like acknowledge. Just I, you know, personally, I find you know, if you you just acknowledge and then you just bring in that knowledge and actually work it in in the both education and when you. When you do that in you know real life situations, so you probably be practicing more actively. Because uh, I was also thinking about um, there's one uh, previous story about this. You know, because it's very hard to do blind audition. You know, when you do investment, it's like and then that high level is like no way you can just have numbers and people without talking to them. But isn't it also just about being brilliant at what you do? I, and, I think, yeah. you know, if you have an amazing idea with an amazing team, an amazing execution, if you're stood in front of an investor, that's what they're going to hear, right? So that's what they're going to perceive, that's what they're going to understand. And they're not going to say, yeah. oh, sorry, Linda, I don't like the fact that you're a woman, actually, despite the amazing idea and the amazing team and yeah. the amazing execution. And so I, I do think it's a, an attitude thing across everybody, right? Yeah. So I, I said earlier, I was surprised to find my gender being an issue, and mostly it was because the guys were teasing me that I'd messed up the statistics. The point was that you know, it was being great at what I did, you know, it was at least as good as I could be at it, to be a, a key contribution to that team and be able to get involved in that kind of way. And if my colleagues recognize that, then they don't have a gender issue. So if women can be more confident to be in those roles, to demonstrate that to their male colleagues, the male colleagues' biases change, uh, and they, they want to get more women in their teams. You know, the fact that I've had this experience of having investors that are actually interested in working, particularly with women, because they like those traits of determination and, and juggling and, uh, and hard work and whatever ethos they're attributing to the female gender in that kind of way. If they're just things that are great traits to have, and that everybody recognizes, I want to bring that into my team, I want to have that mix, that diversity, those skills, those attributes, then it, it becomes less of an issue constantly. Yeah. And I guess the role we can play as women is to make sure that we are there present for those opportunities so that, that more of that reaction can happen. Okay, but then again, it's as much then, you know, we, bring, we bring the responsibility also for men since they are still dominating on the, on the field. And so we, it's just, the more we get, because it's a long process, so we need to get in there and then we still need male help. Just like previous, I don't know if who was here in the Geek Gets panel in the morning, just like the embracing and actually uh, Caroline from Etsy was we, previously, he was giving uh, his talk to his, his male colleagues about you know feminism and how to perceive and how to talk because if you only work with male, you don't even think about that you actually have a way of talking or that might feel offensive or not really, you know, proper. So her good advice was like, uh, if someone, you know, in the male world says something, she's just like, oh, would you say that to your mother instead of like embarrassing person? So is it like this or long-term change that we're trying to then thrive with, we just like, if we're gonna be, you know, how to get more females, you know, invest me if they know that it's, it's hard in, in, in their early stage. I mean, here in Europe, it's, uh, it's not very good angel and seed investment situation. And actually, just previously, this uh, uh, here in Berlin, I was in a startup competition, and I heard that the, uh, the judges said they would uh, never invest in, in a female-only team, since there was actually female, <laughs> female startups pitching. And it was like, those things are still very much, you know, are out there. So what was what was the track record of that investor? Exactly. No, that's the same thing. There's, I mean, of course, good and bad in investors, but they're still out there. And that's exactly. So who would, no one would not, naturally, you don't want to work with them. But then again, there's a very little, you know, capital here, you know, around, which I found that there's coming these news, you know, crowdfunding initiatives and like seed match and, and seeders. And now you're going to be more present. So, uh, do you think that that's, this gonna, we can just like forget about all those comments and then we just do it ourselves also? It's like women, we just, you know, skip the VC world. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Until we get very attractive, you know, because, you know, in the higher level. So this just can't ignore because it's going to be more women. I mean, 
I think kind of getting lost in conversations with kind of, um, to be frank, asshole venture capitalists that say things like that is like a waste of your time. You've got a business to run. Like that person is, you know, off in his life, like probably not having the best relationships with women in general. So <laughs> don't waste an ounce of energy over him because you have a business to run and um, you have customers to, to service and you have employees to, you know, make sure they're happy. So like you've got a lot bigger, bigger problems. And I think it just gets back to like execution. Just know when action speaks louder than words. Execution speaks louder than words. And any smart venture capitalist, whether they're male or female, knows that. And those are the people that you want to be working with anyways. So just rise above all that chatter, because that's all it is, is distraction. Um, but back to, I mean, one statistic, we're back to crowdfunding at least, because I know a lot about crowdfunding. <laughs> um, one statistic I'm actually sp particularly proud of on Indiegogo is that you know, we started off this panel with like 10% of VC-backed companies are run by women or have a woman on their founding team. Um, on Indiegogo, while we have entrepreneurs and, and causes and creative entrepreneurs as well, so it's a little more mixture of, of folks using crowdfunding, 41% um, of successful campaigns are run by women. And that just speaks to kind of how crowdfunding is a meritocracy. And if you have talent and if you're willing to work hard and engage an audience and find customers, which basically in crowdfunding, it's your customers who are financing you, um, you, can be, you can be successful. So, um, and actually women wa raise more money on crowdfunding than men do. Um, so I thought we're kind of digging into the data there more. And I don't know if it's they're more realistic or, or what have you, or they work harder, or I'm not sure. But uh, it's not by much, so it's pretty close. But it is kind of a, a fun little statistic to share. So takeaway is if you find yourself in a conversation with a VC who's like, I don't invest in women, turn around and walk away and never look back. Don't waste your time. Um, it's, it's interesting because there are quite a few aspects here you, you were just mentioning and um, what, I find, what I find interesting is that um, when it comes to um, the IPO or um, dealing with Wall Street or, um, but also with venture capital, one has to understand that it's really not about, um, well it is about data of course because they have all the, all the current data you can provide them with, but it's really about extrapolation, it's really about looking um, uh, what, what can that business or that person, that team, deliver in the future? And um, all of that is obviously um, not written yet. Um, but people will um, have the perception of what is efficient, not actually about what is efficient, but the per perception of how efficient it can be. And um, so what I find really um, important in that issue is to counteract perceptions with data. And um, we have the data how efficient women actually are with capital they raised. Because um, one interesting um, uh, study actually said that women are always, um, or most of, the, most of um, women actually ask for exactly the amount they need, for the, exactly the amount they require, and in the end, they probably get half, while um, male CEOs ask for twice in order to get what they need. Um, but then, in the next step, women are actually more cost efficient and capital efficient because with that less money they have, they actually have more annual revenues than men before. So this is something that is important to say because we have those perceptions, women are not efficient or they can't run the business, they're not as able, we, we don't have that um, revenue expectations and it's important to spread the news to have those stories in terms of... Um, and um, role, role uh, models and in terms of, of storytelling as well. Yes. And that's very interesting that you say that because the study also supported that it's not only the current you know, figures and numbers that, uh, that had to do with the decision, it was about the, uh, the CEO's potential to run the, you know, after IPO. So it's, it's the perception how, how you think that you know, females are going to be executing you know, further. So uh, perception. We need to change that actively. Exactly, change perception and um, also just give, um, to show opportunities and see what's possible. This is where role models come, uh, come in. Um, 
obviously I'm, I'm still convinced, although the study says that uh, females are uh, ranking fem other females or the female founders less as well, I'm, I'm still convinced that um, in the moment we see um, a race of, of, of female VCs as well, of, of the other side of the table, of the environment, of um, crowdfunding platforms, of, of other business angels as well. We haven't talked about business angels yet. I think um, there will be there will be a lot of movement in the market. And um, what we see from the corporate world is that we need about 30%. When we reach a level of 30% in terms of representation, in terms of visibility, this is when things are, are finally going to to change, and we are not there yet. Probably with with entrepreneurial spirit, we are there soon, but in terms on on the capital side of things, we are not there yet. Um, I'm, the name of this is escaping me, but I, I actually know a woman who, in order to address this problem, she's actually started a program to train high net worth women to be angel investors because high net worth women tend to get pushed into philanthropy where they sit on boards of foundations and nonprofits and run charity events and stuff like that. Um, but they're completely in the position to actually put their money into more sustainable things called businesses, <laughs> where especially if it's like a social business or a social venture, it'll both have the social impact as well as the financial returns in a much more sustainable way. So um, I'm, it's, it's, the name is escaping me, but she's getting a ton of traction. Um, and I just think it's a really clever way to approach this problem because um, it's closing. It's probably one of the fastest ways to close the gap between um, you know the lack of money going into women-led startups. Because if there is a bias towards your gender, if men are biased towards gender and women are or sorry, if men are biased towards men and women are biased towards women, then get a slew of women in here <laughs> to start pouring money into women ventures, and then and then it'll even out, and then hopefully all the biases will just go away. And I think that was just actually just to bring back Dave McClure and 500 Startups. I think they just started this challenge, like, you know, have more women to invest in women. They, they had like, so if, I, if I'm ready to invest in a female or a three one, and you just uh, sign up. So he had the petition to, to females to sign up and start actually angel investment. So it's not that hard. And, you know, so you can get support and you know, even a small amount, so you can start actually actively investing in, in women, even if you don't really believe in that kind of bias and quotas. But obviously, if I understand from this panel, it's like we need to you know, change the perception, we need to you know, just you know, increase and be, have role models and increase females in both sides. And meanwhile, we do the uh, little short and rude, and you know, we have to, you know, we, we're the one interviewing VCs too, so never forget that, and you know, don't talk to the assholes. So, you know, you can have the, you males will, you know, you'll run into them too. So, uh, but it's, it'll, it'll, we females, we hear other stuff, you know, that you, you don't get to hear. So, um, literally ask them what their wife, and literally ask them what their wife does for a living. Yeah. It will put them on the spot. It will put them on the spot like no other, but they might earn a ton of respect for you when you do it. So we have some time before everyone just falls asleep and you can start throwing stuff at us and we can throw stuff at you. But, you know, a couple of minutes, any questions about the green ceiling that we're about to change to any, uh, you know, color of our favor, I don't know. And everyone's going to get funded if you have great, great ideas and great execution on that. So please, now you have these intelligent ladies who actually have raised money, are raising money, know how to communicate. And even if you don't have that many ladies raising money here now, you can all ask uh, questions. Please. Thank you. Can you hear me? I hope so. Thank you uh, for, for an interesting discussion so far. Um, I kind of hear that, like in America, it's a bit I mean, maybe I, I hope I understood that correct, that it's a bit more developed uh, and that Europe is a bit more difficult as a market at the moment. But I was wondering what are the actual strategies that you are proposing as a part, uh, I mean, not, not personal strategies, but that, because that's what you were talking about, like what, I mean, women can actually do by themselves, but what can we do collectively? <laughs> I mean, are there any whatever platforms or get togethers, etc. I'm, I'm not in the field, so that's why I'm asking. Maybe they are, and then you can just uh, share them. 
I just start. Um, start creating creating more models. Be visible. That's that's important um, to stress the point um, that there are successful female leaders around. Um, another point is um, uh, to well to create networks and to have formal networks, to have informal networks, business related, female related, um, and also multiple dots and not just single focus um, networks. I think that is, that is really um, important um, to connect, to collaborate, to be open, to throw yourself out there as we just heard. Um, and yeah, to, to, to fight off perceptions that are just not true anymore. Um, and I think this is not just a task for, for women, with women. I mean, there's this a great sentence of, um, of um, Margaret Thatcher uh, saying there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. So that is important, support, support, your, um, support your, your peer group. But um, it's also um, important for, for men to be educated on that topic, to, to know how to um, identify a glass ceiling or a green ceiling within their environment and to, to actively counteract that. Yeah, you know, get together with other women or even, even other male entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter, and do like practice pitch sessions and, and have people tear you apart. Like, you are too nice be direct, you know, stuff like that. And when you organize these events, don't ask if people are interested. <laughs> Say, we're having this event. <laughs> uh, if, you're in, if you are coming, let me know. Um, you know, so start practicing maybe playing with the language you use in communications um, to test to see if it gets different kind of response rates. But always be aware of, of what you're intentionally doing because you don't necessarily want to fall too far on the other side either and then become someone that you're not either. So try to be as self-aware as possible, but know that what you're doing is you're fighting maybe an up, some, some biases out there, so you have to put on a little bit of a, a, uni, a uniform to, uh, to, deal, to, to handle it. Um, I, I was just going to add to the comments there to say it, it, it's that extrapolation of never missing an opportunity. You know, making sure that everybody around you benefits from every opportunity. So if it's you, don't self-select out. Make sure you present yourself. If it's your colleague, your friend, you know, and, and, and as I say, it's not by gender. So if you're a... I have so many very senior female colleagues that have said they never would have applied for what they did if it wasn't for a male friend or colleague that said, you should do that. And, and so the role that men can play is also in terms of encouragement in that kind of way because women will naturally self-select out. So what they can do themselves is try not to do that, make themselves present for the opportunity. And as husbands, boyfriends, business partners, colleagues, also help your female friends, colleagues to make sure that they do. If you see that they're great at doing that, make sure they do that. And that helps your business. That helps your life. You know, so we can all contribute yeah. in that way. Yeah. And you just reminded me of something. Also, <laughs> embrace the whatever, if it's whatever, whether it's like typically female characteristics or whatever. Um, embrace those if those characteristics have actually brought value to your company and celebrate those. So an example of this is um, when we were five people and we were about to start hiring a lot, I was very concerned that we were just going to haphazardly hire and we were going to get the wrong kind of people and we we're going to hire people who are selfish and greed driven and they weren't all about our ambition, which is to democratize fundraising. So I was like, okay, well, we got to like define our values and use that as like a filter for the type of people that we hire. And like, you know, I didn't know what this values exercise was going to be, but I asked like friends um, to give, you know, ideas and stuff like that. And, um, I was talking to my male co-founder, and he's like, what the hell is this? I was like, no, we, this is important. This is like the glue that's going to help us hire. He's like, I don't, I don't understand, like, why are we doing this? I'm like, okay, let's just have a conversation. Just go with this with me for a while. And um, so we had like a 30-minute conversation. We were talking about like why we love coming to work every day and like all this kind of stuff. And my, I could tell my like co-founder was getting really impatient because it's like, what are, the, what are the results from this conversation? Like, where is this getting us? You know, there was no, like, real actionable results. And so it was, like, this tension. I'm like, 
trust me, just trust me here. Because I'm like doing the touchy feely thing, which is like, you know, totally typically female. And um, so then we had to have like two more conversations. And finally, we actually got somewhere and we had like these values that kind of fell out, which was like these four words that defined all of us. And we all kind of had this aha moment. We're like, oh my God, this is like who we are as people. And so then we started using that as a filter to hire people. And we went from five people to 18 people. And now we're at 40 people. And to this day, every single person that gets hired goes through culture interviews. And if they're not you know, collaborative, fearless, um, authentic, or empowering, which is our four values, they don't get hired. And every time somebody starts um, on the job, they get trained in those values as this is who we are. And you can hold all your colleagues accountable. And Almost every single employee, after they get trained, they come back, they're like, I absolutely love working at Indiegogo because I feel like I belong here. Like, it, the, my happiness, my employee happiness is important here. And now they're like recruiting all their friends like crazy to come work and we're growing. And the takeaway here is, at first I was kind of embarrassed by doing the girl thing and being like, let's be touchy-feely. And then our investor asked me the question, he's like, you know, I've kind of noticed that like all your employees love working at Indiegogo because they like really believe in this mission. I'm like, oh yeah, that's very intentional. Like blah, blah, blah. And I totally told him the exercise that we went through for values and he was, his like jaw was dropped. Like he had, he was like, what the, whoa. And then I went to another dinner with another investor and all of our portfolio, and all of their portfolio companies. And we got onto the topic of culture and it was me and it was every other entrepreneur was a dude and, or a guy, sorry. And um, we got into the topic of culture, and all, every guy was like, oh, yeah, I haven't done the culture thing yet. It's like, it's always the 11th thing on their top 10 list to do, so it never gets done. And I went through the whole values thing, and everyone was like, holy shit, that's what we're missing. And our investors were like, oh, my God. Like, and all of a sudden, it was just like that touchy-feely thing that was like historically a girly thing to do became a total competitive advantage over all these other startups. And it made these other CEO guys feel kind of like completely incompetent. And it actually inspired them to like go do something about it. So sorry that took a really long time to explain, but embrace whatever characteristics you have and see how those characteristics are actually driving value for your company and then celebrate the crap out of it. So there we have an opportunity to also educate the investors. So it works both ways. We just, we're not going to be the passive ones, you know, raising funding. We, we can actually, you know, also use, because the crowdfunding and everything is showing the traction and engagement and everything, you just be more visible and have more power on your side to show, you know, the investors why they should invest in you. Yeah. Right. So any more questions? There's one more. Great. Hi. Thanks again also for the lovely conversation. Um, I, I was curious about the study you mentioned and uh, from the biased people that you found, the, the investors that were biased, did they find that any relationship between them, like social background or education or something? Yes, that was the one that was like really troubling. There was, I could really find you no know, loopholes that really eliminated all you know, those biases and they'd done a really good job. And they actually, also they, the industry that they chose was in, um, in medical, so, you know, uh, what's it called? Cosmetic surgery. Uh, so everything that, you know, it could be a female CEO and they really work with the top management team and diversity and everything. And I was like, I couldn't find... Every time I was thinking, oh, did you think of that? And then I just, next sentence, yes, they did. So they were very... It wasn't just about proving how females are being uh, disadvantaged. It's about more concerned about the, the economy since, you know, almost 50% are female entrepreneurs. And so it, it wasn't done in... in uh, in terms of you know seeing how badly females are doing or treated, so I think I didn't explain very well what I meant. I meant the the investors that were biased. Yeah. Did you find any relation between them? Not the 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 ones applying. Oh, the ones who participated in the study, they were MBAs that were chosen in the being the same level as as these uh, investment bankers and investors. So so they would they would have the same skill level, and they also acknowledged that of course they are not you know actual investors, but they had run the study 
previous, you know, prior with the, you know, high 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 level investors and acknowledged investors who'd said that oh they would never go and fall for that kind of bias since you know of course we always invest in you know there's numbers and there's execution all that stuff and then yet those investors also fell for you know shortly on that study so uh, did that answer better? I will also tweet the link to the study. It's it's 40 pages and, and you know it's not that bad. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We can take it afterwards in, you know, if I just really didn't understand your question. But So it was about students who, who participated in the study, but it was all uh, run through before in the, in the real world. And it was real world company and CIF, you know, all that stuff. More? Yes, hi. I wanted to know the role that mentors have played in your careers and if you have had any positive experiences to share with us, be that with a male mentor or with a female mentor, and perhaps what the difference has been for you in your careers. Awesome question. Yeah, great question. Mentors are vitally important, and make sure to seek them out. So throughout, throughout my whole career, I've always felt incredibly fortunate to have amazing mentors. But it does take work, and the responsibility is always on the mentee to make sure the relationship happens, right? So it, you're asking somebody to give you help and advice, and they'll love it. They'll love doing it. Um, but, but you have to make sure that you spend the time, invest the time to develop that relationship. Um, in terms of the specifics of your question, interestingly for me, actually, most of my mentors have been men. Um, and I remember one that I've had for a very long time. One of his first key pieces of advice to me was actually never ever lose your femininity. He's a very senior man in the city, he's incredibly successful, he has a very powerful wife. Um, it's quite an interesting comment from, uh, from earlier. Um, and I thought what was fascinating about that is echoing the point that Jeanette made earlier is that ultimately we're all memorable for being distinct, male, female, you know, what people remember about you is the, the element about you that makes that the key ethos you know I went to the meeting I met this amazing person the, the reason I remember them is this and by trying to pretend to be something you're not by trying not to live up to what makes you distinct makes you less memorable so and, and that's not a gender thing specifically so I, I, I felt his advice was amazing actually in a very male dominated world um, that he said make sure that whatever you have that helps you be distinct helps you be memorable don't ever lose those elements of yourself. So that would be the piece of advice and that mentor I'd share. Great, I guess we're sort of running out of time because now there's only, only us and then, you know, between the drinks and the party, so we should wrap it up. Uh, so if I would just shortly try to find a you know, concluding uh, sentence, I've been trying to figure out here. So if you're heading for an IPO, whether you're male or female, you should embrace what you have and don't be embarrassed and celebrate your gender and give a hoot about bad investors. They're not going to help you any other. There's going to be a divorce, which you can't do because you can't divorce your investors. And uh, also, thank you so much for all the great insights about both the company culture and how to communicate and uh, the recruiting and mentoring. So. Uh, I think, hope there's a lot of takeaways from this talk. And so thank you, Linda, and thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Danae. And where do we find you online? How do we find you? Uh, you, definitely, you can definitely find me on Indiegogo. <laughs> and on Twitter, I'm Gogo Danae. Yeah, you find me on the internet as well. Um, on Twitter, my Twitter handle is Jeanne Rafu. I think you all saw my Twitter handle earlier, so Linda Ching UK. We're all online being geeks. <laughs> so please thank these lovely ladies and thank you for actually making this Women in Tech Day an incredible day. So we reached our quota or ratio, 60 40. And thank you to all international guests coming in also this late. So please give a big hand to yourselves and all ourselves. And I... Oh, did I do something? Well, your time is out. <laughs> Hello?